Hello. Welcome to Roy Book Reviews. I, of course, am Roy. Um, in case you didn't recognize me, it's because I am wearing a face mask in my attempt to enter the Guinness Book of World Records. I will be, let me turn the music down here, attempting to do an entire book review video while my mouth and nose are covered um, with a face mask. Um, I don't believe this has ever been done, so I am looking forward um, to the fame and glory that this gives me. Okay, none of that, what I just said is true. I just wanted to show you the awesome face mask that I recently had done up, the book cover of my second novel, Matters of Convenience. I have one with uh, the cover of my first novel, Patches of Grey, headed my way soon, and I think I'm going to get one made up for my forthcoming children's book, The Absolutely Adve Amazing Adventures of Ava Applesauce, um, coming to me as well, because we all have a lot of time on our hands these days, including me, and we have to wear these face masks, so might as well have some fun with it and put some images on them. Um, that I want the world to see. I also want the world to hear my thoughts, not just about my own writing, but the writing of others. And that's why I have this book review channel. And that's why I'm here today to discuss um, the latest novel that I'm reviewing, which is The Light in the Ruins by Chris Bajalian. Uh, the Light in the Ruins is actually the second Chris Bajalian book um, that I've read. Um, first one was several years ago, and I probably will not be doing a video for that one uh, because I don't think I wrote a particularly um, thorough review of it on Goodreads, and uh, my memory is not good enough to go into great detail about it. I will talk a little bit about it towards the end of this review. Uh, but I did put down my thoughts in full about The Light in the Ruins. Um, so I am going to discuss them here with you now. Um, the narrative of this novel uh, jumps back and forth between the years 1943 and 1955. The earliest setting takes place in an Italian countryside during World War II. Um, at that time, Mussolini's Italy was an ally to Hitler's Germany um, during the war. And, but for a portion of that time, German soldiers treated Italy like an occupied nation rather than viewing its citizens as brothers in arms. During this period of uneasy alliance, members of the wealthy Rosati family have rather complicated relationships with the German military, as well as with um, their neighbors. Um, majority of their labors, their neighbors being considerably less prosperous than them. Um, the Rosatis are by far um, the wealthiest um, family in the area that they live, own the most amount of land. Um, the Rosatis host parties for the Germans. Um, they don't really have a whole lot of choice. Um, refusing would have given them rather dangerous enemies. Uh, the eldest members of well, the eldest sons of the family serve in the mil military for Italy, and therefore they are in partnership um, with uh, the Germans. Uh, their beautiful sister falls in love with a German soldier, whom she believes to be more decent and humane. Um, that is comrades, um, whether he truly is or whether it's just the fact that she is in less than in love with this uh, young German soldier. Um, you will find out um, as you read the book. I will not give any spoilers in that regard. Anyway, back to my review, which I am reading um, from Goodreads. The Rosati family's cozy relationship uh, with Germans um, is set in motion by the wish of uh, Germany, of Hitler, 
um, to not only take over the world, but also to plunder much of its art in the process. Um, as you uh, may know, um, in addition to being um, a psychopath, um, a man who was determined to take over the world um, and to kill anyone who he considered inferior or who was in his way, he also happened to be an art lover. Um, as a younger man, he even um, dabbled in art or architecture um, himself. Um, as the leader of Germany, he decided that whoever he took over, he could take over their art. And even though Germany didn't take over Italy, um, they still were pushing Italy around and therefore they were taking plenty of art um, from Italy. And Italy, of course, has quite a bit of that um, to take, including the fictional Rosati family. Um, because they have an ancient Etruscan burial site on their land. Um, so they are rather cozy with the Germans who are coming by periodically to you know, have dinners there and to visit the burial site and to take from it uh, whatever they want to bring back um, to their Führer or to whoever it is they're bringing this art to, um, to admire. And the neighbors, you know, just are just seeing the Rosati family as being in cahoots with the Germans, um, decided to side with them for self-preservation. And this, of course, uh, breeds resentment. Well, flashing forward to the 1950s, the book's plot revolves around a serial killer who, for unknown reasons, is targeting members of the Rosati family ripping the heart out of each victim to cap off the vicious murders. Uh, there are two Italian detectives on the case, a man and a woman. Um, at this time in the 1950s, to be a female detective in Italy um, was a rather rare accomplishment. Uh, this detective is not only a woman, um, but she's also an armed um, police officer and the book makes clear that she stands out from her peers in that regard. So back to my review here. Uh, the woman detective has a relationship with the Rosati family that dates back to the war when she was severely injured and they helped nurse her back to health. Um, as the fast-paced novel draws to its conclusion on a dual track where we're in the 1940s um, when the war is taking place and then we're in the 1950s where um, the serial killings are taking place and these detectives are trying to um, catch up to the killer and um, stop him before he strikes again. And the only thing they know about him is that he's probably killing exclusively members of this family. So at least they know where to watch, who to watch, who to protect. Um, as a fast paced novel draws to its conclusion, I neither, we, we learned the identity and the motivation of the killer in the final pages of this book. And as I started to say a little too early, I neither loved nor hated this book. I, I was a, it was a fairly fast paced read. Both sections of it were interesting enough. I learned um, a fair amount about Italy and the atmosphere during World War II and the relationship with the Germans and a lot of things that you know have not really read about in depth in the past. Uh, one of the reasons I enjoy reading historical fiction is because I feel like I'm getting uh, killing two birds with one stone. I am engrossed in an interesting story, but I'm also learning um, things that I guess I did not manage to pick up 
um, during my years as a student in social studies and history class. Um, and I am not a huge reader of nonfiction, so the odds of me um, learning this through grabbing some heavy textbook uh, is pretty small. But because I do like to read historical fiction, I do end up learning about um, the, the past, American past, as well as other parts of the world and different time periods and just um, the way that people were and, and the, to what degrees it's very similar to today and to what degree things were very different. And this is one of the advantages of reading historical fiction is that you, you know, basically go into a time machine or time capsule capsule and get to find out how, not the other half, but our forefathers, foremothers lived um, throughout the world. Um, so that was one of the things that attracted me to this book. And the author definitely did their research um, and I feel um, that, you know, I learned a, a good deal about this time period and also the 1950s, which is not quite as dramatic. We didn't have the war going on, but it still was um, an interesting time in an interesting place. Um, but ultimately, I was judging this book not by how much I feel I learned about, you know, Italy in the 30s, 40s, 50s, but by how much I was entertained um, and enthralled by the story. And it was so-so. I mean, I, I enjoyed the book. I enjoyed the dual paths that it took me on, but I cannot say um, that I loved it. Uh, I suppose that I expected or hoped for a little more from it, perhaps because of the earlier book I read um, by this author um, that very much impressed me at the time. Um, the writing in The Light in the Ruins um, is somewhat boilerplate. Um, it's effective enough to keep readers engaged and curious to see how things will work out. If you're a fan of whodunits, and that's another reason I picked up this book, because I love a good mystery, whether it's said um, in the past or the present or the future. Um, though this particular one, I don't believe you will have much of a chance of figuring out who the killer is on your own. There's kind of a lot of information that's just hurried um, to the reader in the last pages, and that's where you learn the who, what, where, when, why, how. Um, I like whodunits where I feel that there's a chance, at least, that I could figure it out on my own, even though I usually do not. Um, but when I read one where I'm like, oh, there's no chance I ever would have figured that out because there was too much information that was withheld until the final pages... I could feel, a little, you know, sometimes feel a little cheated um, in that regard. Uh, if you're a, a fan of whodunits and of war novels and of historical fiction with a dash of romance and of art history, uh, The Light in the Ruins will reward you with all of these elements. Uh, you may or may not fall in love with this book. I said I fell in like with it. Um, you definitely won't be bored by, by it. Uh, the first book I wrote, I read by Chris Bajalian, um, it's called Transistor Radio, and that was about someone who was going through a sex change. Um, so therefore, needless to say, uh, these books cover radically different subject matter, um, which means that Chris Bajalian is um, obviously not someone who sticks to a particular genre or, or a particular subject matter or a particular cast of characters, uh, but is all over the map with his writing. And that is something um, I greatly admire um, in any writer. Uh, most of you um, sure have 
your favorite authors and is that you have read, you know, throughout their catalog and not a, that it's the same book over and over and over, but there certainly is a comfort zone um, that authors tend to be in and they tend to be writing about a particular time period or a particular place or you know, a particular genre of story. Um, Chris Bajalian apparently is not in that category. He writes about whatever the hot heck pops into mind. If it's um, if he's interested in sex change, he writes about that. If he's interested in um, serial killers or World War II, he writes about that. Um, therefore, I have no idea what the next Chris Bajalian book that I pick up will be about because the books that I've read so far give me absolutely no clue, but I definitely will give him another shot based on the first two that I read. Definitely a talented author. And that's all I have to say about The Light in the Ruins. Um, I hope you enjoy it at least as much as me, if not more. Now I am going to put back my face mask, put the music back on. Until next time, this is Roy of Roy's Book Reviews, wishing you a pleasant quarantine. This is Slow Blues by Buddy Guy.